good evening everyone and i extend you all a very warm welcome to this 14th webinar series which is an educational initiative jointly undertaken by philip capital and bsc with the sole objective of sharing knowledge and market insights for everyone connected to global markets it's indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you and thank you so much for taking your time out to be present in this webinar my name is vishaka and i am a part of fx advisory desk at philip capital philip capital is established in singapore in 1975 we have global presence in over 15 countries and we have assets under management around 35 billion dollars and we have over 1 million clients worldwide at this onset i would like to thank mr vivek krishnamurthy and mr rajendra sharma for sparing their valuable time and for consenting to be part of this webinar series to share their valuable market insights Mr Rajendra Sharma is head of business development and business analytics at BSC over to you sir thank you vishaka am i audible yes sir you are audible and thank you vishaka a very good evening to everyone uh, it gives me immense pleasure to share stage with vivek who is like an expert and champion on ai and ml uh, which probably is the need of the hour and every organization every large fintech broker You name it, and they have this AI and ML de delved up into their software so that people are able to execute trade at the speed of a button. So I'll just give you a brief uh, background about Bombay Stock Exchange. The name doesn't require any introduction, but just for the sake of you, uh, we are the fastest with a speed of six microsecond, largest with almost five thousand companies listed on BSE Exchange, and world's oldest with almost one forty-eight year history. Uh, an exchange which is which is a universal exchange offering equity, equity derivatives, currency derivatives, commodity derivatives, SME startup. When it comes to listing, when it comes to distribution, it is into insurance, it is into distribution of mutual fund. So you name it, and they are there. And probably in the upcoming segment like EGR, which we have got recently got an approval, and we will be launching EGR, the electronic gold receipt, which we would. Which could excite a lot of retail customers, even gold hedgers or maybe the billion traders who may want to place orders on the exchange platform in a transparent way and hedge themselves. So that there could be an opportunity for everyone on BSC. And um, in the recent time, we have seen a lot of orders being pumped into the exchange with the increase in volume. Almost 45 crore to 50 crore orders. On a daily basis, are pumped into on an exchange platform. So that shows the capacity and the strength that the system has to actually take the load. And a lot of large HFT guys, the algo traders, the prop traders, all of them are active. So probably uh, going forward, technology is where you will be seeing a lot of action, and they will be driving the volumes. Uh, in the earth file scenario, it used to be people who used to be doing manual trading, the dealers. But going forward, it will be machine-driven. So this is where AI and ML would be playing a big role, and we are here to understand how it could benefit and impact every one of us who are connected into the financial market, irrespective of which product we trade. So I think Vivek should be able to enlighten us and give a broader perspective of how it is going to work, what are the advantages, what are the loopholes, or maybe the shortcuts which we'll be able to. Uh, safeguard ourselves when you are using machine trading. So, I, without taking much of a time, I'll just hand over to Vivek, who can just take this forward and enlighten us how AI and ML is going to affect us in the, in the near term. Thank uh, you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, I would uh, invite Mr. Vivek Krishnamurthy. He is head of content and research at Quant Institute. He teaches data analytics, building quant strategies, and time series analysis using Python. He has over 15 years of experience in in India, Singapore, and Canada in industry, academia, and research. He is the co-author of the books Python Basics and a Rough and Ready Guide to Algorithmic Trading. He has a bachelor's in electronics and telecom engineering from VESIT Mumbai University and an MBA from NTU Singapore. It's indeed a pleasure to have you on this panel, and I welcome you once again. A request for all the participants: if they have any questions, they can write to us in the chat box. And once the session is over, we will take them up. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Vivek sir. Uh, thank you so much, Vishaka, and uh, also thank you, Rajesh. Uh, I hope I got that name right. It's Mr. Rajendra Sharma. Rajendra, sorry, my bad. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sharma, also for uh, your kind words. 
before I begin, I hope I am audible to you all and I'm also visible to you all. Yes, sir. Great. So I'm now going to put my screen on share. Please confirm if you can see it, all right? Yeah. Before we begin today's proceedings. All right. Is my screen visible, guys? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is. Perfect. All right. So uh, we have a pretty tall ask. That is, we have very limited time and we need to look at how AI and ML are used in financial markets. So uh, obviously, considering the fact that we are exploring a topic which is as deep and as wide as, uh, you know, the oceans and as the mountains, uh, we will try and get a, a, I would say like a 10,000 feet view on how these things work and a, a few illustrations here and there should also help you guys uh, connect it back to the markets, right? Now, uh, this is like a standard disclaimer that I uh, would do in any kind of knowledge session, which is any kind of strategies or any kind of investment related uh, recommendations or suggestions or strategies that I share is purely for educational purposes. This is not meant for you to decide to go and take uh, positions in the markets because of that. Uh, so this, this, so the trading strategies and related information as mentioned is for informational purposes only. All right. So with that disclaimer out of the way, uh, let me start off with, uh, you know, this quote that one of the, I would say, important voices in the field of artificial intelligence says that uh, the field is probably where electricity was about 100 odd years ago. And uh, the fact is that AI and ML are going to touch our lives in nearly every uh, aspect of human life, whether it's sports, whether it's markets, whether it's uh, marriage, buying uh, stuff online, e-commerce, real estate, you name it, and uh, its impact is, is being seen and is going to be seen in various sectors across uh, uh, whatever human beings work on, all right? So uh, let me first start off with what the agenda for the day is. So I'll first talk a little bit about us. That is Quan Insti, the organization I come from. Um, I, I don't think I'll speak too much about myself uh, because... Vishaka has kindly already spoken a little bit about me and my background. I'll give you guys a small primer on what AI and ML is. My sense is this audience is uh, largely non-technical and uh, presuming that I'm going to talk a little bit about AI and ML uh, so that the rest of the session becomes a little more palatable for you guys. All right. Uh, we'll then talk a little bit about the current trading and investing landscape why AI and ML is even being used these days, how it's being used specifically in the context of the financial markets. Uh, we'll, we'll touch upon an illustration of its use in markets. And uh, I'll show you guys what is going on in the world of academia. So people are trying different tests out on various data sets and, you know, reporting their findings. We'll, we'll, we'll get a you know, a, a kind of a teaser from there as to what, what's going on there. And uh, after all of that, I want to specifically also touch upon the challenges and the risks of using any kind of artificial in intelligence enabled systems in uh, specifically in the context of the financial markets. And uh, I'll round it out with some concluding words uh, after which we'll open it up for Q&A, right? Now, as Vishaka mentioned, at any point in time, you guys have questions, please feel free to go and type it out in the chat box. Right now, as we speak, I do not see that screen, but I will open it uh, towards the end of my session, right? Okay, now uh, specific to us, as I mentioned, I come from Quan Insti. Now, Quan Insti is the education and research arm of IRH Capital. Now, IRH Capital is one of the largest high frequency trading firms in India. And uh, we are market makers in uh, many of the options and futures contracts that are uh, traded out there on uh, the National Stock Exchange. Now, Quan Insti itself, uh, as I mentioned, is an education and research arm of uh, IRH. And 
we have i would say four broad products uh, un in, uh, under our uh, system one of them is the epat <clears throat> now this is like a six month long course it's very intense uh, lectures happen over the weekends uh, so you have about 40 odd lectures uh, each of them are about 3 to 3 and a half hours length uh, this is uh, uh, got like assignments it's got quizzes and it's got uh, a detailed look at uh, i would say various facets of quantitative finance so that's programming that's statistics and there's uh, financial theory which covers various asset classes then we have quantra which are self paced learning courses so these are specifically meant for people who have maybe anything from say 3 to 10 hours of time and they would like to learn a specific topic so you have various uh, types of courses which are at in introduction level intermediate level as well as advanced level primarily focused on creating trading strategies on various asset classes whether it's uh, options um equities of course fx and uh, even things like cryptocurrencies which are you know uh, uh, one of the popular flavors these days we have a course called csaf which is the newest uh, product in our umbrella under our uh, uh, ages so this is primarily a certificate for sentiment analysis and alternative data that's also becoming very very popular in the world of finance and uh, financial markets so this is about months long uh, again lectures happen over the weekends so it's kind of similar to the epat where, uh, but with a special focus on sentiment uh, data as well as alternative data which is uh, quite popular in in the in the world because of the data that gets generated and uh, finally we have blue shift which is like a, a research back testing and live trading platform where uh, you have a lot of features such as access to data for the last uh, 10 odd years at minute level at tick by tick level to run all sorts of uh, back tests to try various strategies out and 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 uh, you know fine tune them before you take them live into the markets so uh, the long and short of it is we are focused on a systematic approach to trading where we would like to bring in the best that uh, the whole scientific enterprise has in terms of this rigor that we bring to uh, analyzing the data and uh, creating hypotheses, testing it out before we actually launch ourselves out there in the markets, right? Okay, so this is just a little bit about me, which uh, anyways, you guys uh, heard about. I, uh, I, I basically have uh, experience both in industry and academia, and uh, I come with, uh, you know, a, by, by trade, I have a, a engineering degree, uh, at bachelor's level, and then I have an MBA in finance uh, post that, right? Okay, so as I mentioned, we'll start off with a little primer on AI and machine learning. So now artificial intelligence has been around since uh, the 50s. Uh, that was the first time it was mentioned. You had various, uh, I would say, founding uh, fathers, maybe we could call that, uh, such as Alan Turing or McCarthy, Herbert Simon, and various other uh, gentlemen who are generally speaking part of the computer science world who start our, started off with this field of artificial intelligence. This all started post World War II. And it's had its phases over time where there was a lot of hype created, uh, but, but uh, the technology didn't live up to the hype. People put in a lot of money, governments, whether it was the US government or the Japanese government or the British government, many governments funded all sorts of ventures. Uh, not and, uh, and quite a few of them did not live up to the expectations that were getting created. So this has happened a few times uh, in the last 60, 70 years. But what we are seeing currently, that is over the last maybe 15 odd years, is this, uh, I would say this, this special time in history when I three or four different things have happened together. So for one, there is this explosion in the amount of data that is getting created these days, right? Uh, so you have tracking devices across the board in various fields, whether it's wristwatch I wear, or it's the phone I carry in my pocket, or it's the browsing I do on the internet. Uh, a lot of data is being tracked 
and not just in the world of finance within the world of finance too we 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 track markets uh, we track prices and volume movements and uh, changes in the bid ask spread and what have you uh, at shorter and shorter time intervals so there's a lot of data that's getting created not just that it's concomitantly happening with advancements in hardware so both at storage level as well as at processing level you have things like moore's law which have kicked in where you are getting access to bigger and bigger storage spaces at lower and lower costs and uh, and if all of that is not enough you even have cloud storage and cloud computing out there right so you have uh, all of us have uh, you know google suite accounts we 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 all use you know android devices we have drive.google.com and uh, which gives us like a crazy amount of storage where we store various things um you have uh, companies like microsoft and amazon and google which also have cloud servers these days right so even computation is now getting pushed into the cloud so and all of these are pretty affordable pretty cheap often free so so we have data we have uh, ways and means to store that data at cheap rates and not not even necessarily store it on our own workstations we can even store it on, uh, using these cloud infrastructure that's gotten created and the third thing uh, is algorithms right so uh, with things like the open source revolution you have a uh, very very powerful algorithms which have also are also within arms reach right so for instance you have the whole tensor flow uh, framework for artificial intelligence kind of systems you want to design or you have pytorch or you have cafe so all of these things are freely available to create production level production grade uh, artificial intelligence systems uh, again accessible to the retail uh, guy on the street right Uh, let alone having institutions have access to it with taking you know paid subscriptions for these things so you have the third thing which i spoke about which is algorithms uh, very powerful ones which are able to uh, augment themselves with access to hardware as well as data which are both needed in order for these algorithms to work uh, over time and because of all this you also have large capital investments that have come so everywhere you see you hear organizations wanting to increase their budgets for any kind of artificial intelligence or machine learning based uh, initiatives that happen within organizations right uh, even in terms of hiring in terms of uh, budget outlays at economy levels at industry levels at organizational levels uh, and even uh, if you look at the proliferation of data science kind of courses available right these days anywhere you look you find these kind of courses too so uh, clearly we, we we are at a point where uh, there are quite a few expect quite a bit of expectations that have been built up with respect to this field of artificial intelligence now what makes it different from i would uh, from say a traditional software kind of system i would say the chief difference between an ai enabled system and a traditional software system is uh, as you can see on your screens is the fact that uh, you have you're moving closer and closer to what is called implicit programming so here the programmer or the uh, the the creator of uh, the author of the program is not creating everything about what the machine or that software system needs to do when it encounters a certain problem you're creating a system where the machine is uh, kind of teaching itself or learning on its own what needs to be done now this is uh, as opposed to what happens in explicit programming where the human being or the programmer is uh, spelling out what the machine can and cannot do right so what powers this entire uh, system is the fact that the algorithm is able to improve itself with experience and experience is essentially code for data right so the more the more events take place the more data gets generated and all of this data gets fed into your algorithm which starts improving itself now in a traditional setup what happens is this algorithm is pre programmed and no amount of uh, uh times that that specific 
program or that algorithm is used is going to change its functionality or uh, its efficiency as such, right? And this happens because uh, your AI or ML enabled systems rely on not just the code, but also the data, which is uh, like the fuel, which helps it improve and produce reliable output. Uh, whereas in, a, in case of a traditional software system, the, the data produced or the data uh, ingested is independent of uh, the, the functioning of that specific system, right? Now with these AI enabled systems, they also these days process a lot of what is called alternative or rich data. So this kind of data comes from audio, from video, from images. So processing this kind of information is also comp computationally intensive, both at memory level, as well as at processing level, right? Whereas uh, when you talk about a traditional setup, it would typically deal with standard data. So like CSV files, <clears throat> or the kind of data that you get from databases when you send queries out and you retrieve information from there. So these are some differences between, uh, you know, the, the traditional setups and the AI enabled setups. Now, when you specifically talk about uh, artificial intelligence, there are many different definitions that are out there. Simply put, it's like the Turing test, right? Where um, it's indistinguishable to uh, say whether an action was performed by a computer or by a human being, right? So that's what we would say in an informal setting. If we want to be formal, it's essentially a system where human beings create the objectives, but the system decides to make predictions or take decisions. And how does it do that? It does it by using the input which uh, is essentially data to gather it all together and abstract it in a manner where it creates a model or a, or a map, <clears throat> which helps it formulate options for information or action. Right. So that's, so this is essentially, you know, basically definitions, uh, of, of artificial intelligence. Now the term itself is like a catch all phrase, right. And it's used to describe anything which mimics the way our human brain works, right? So at different stages uh, in the evolution of human knowledge, uh, things have been considered part of AI. So machine learning for sure is, is I would say, uh, it sits squarely under the AI umbrella. You have computer vision, which is essentially to do with image processing. You have uh, statistics, you have natural language processing, you have deep learning. So there are all of these various fields that are all considered to be part of uh, AI, right? And uh, let me specifically talk about machine learning. This is uh, all about pattern recognition and trying to exploit what you get by recognizing or finding certain patterns uh, in large data sets. Now, when you have smaller data sets, this could even be possible at a human level where uh, a, a trained eye could spot certain patterns that occur within the markets. So for instance, very seasoned traders may notice certain uh, head and shoulders pattern, pa patterns or certain other kind of patterns, which helps them decide whether they want to go long or go short. But with uh, this kind of, you know, uh, deluge of data that gets created, it's very hard for us to keep a track and, you know, keep an eye out on every kind of data set that gets created, right? So you use machines in order to do that. Uh, and essentially that's what machine learning is all about. It's used uh, for stock price prediction. It's used for image recognition. A very common application is for spam detection that we have in our inboxes. So. Every time you find emails go into the spam folder, sometimes even genuine emails get tagged as spam. And sometimes it's the, it's the reverse, right? Some uh, email appears in your regular inbox when it ought to have been spam. So then you uh, click on the button that says uh, mark as spam or mark as not spam. And your system, that is the, the underlying algorithm that's uh, underlying your email account management, uh, is learning from its own mistakes, right? So uh, that essentially is basically machine learning. 
now machine learning itself comes under a, a, there are various types of machine learning and uh, to give you guys a, a, a snapshot of what it has i would say there are three major types so one is what is called supervised machine learning the second is unsupervised the third is deep learning or reinforcement learning now uh, supervised learning is where you are able to tell the algorithm what the inputs are and what the output ought to be so you have sort of the answers along with all of the characteristics associated with that particular data set so for instance um if the objective is to predict the stock price you pick out all the information pertaining to the stock price so it could be in the history of the price or it could mean uh fundamental data about that specific stock so if you are looking at a company like uh, say infosys all the accounting information that comes from there so their uh information from their balance sheet or their income statement you have various ratios like return on equity and uh, debt to equity ratio and so on so all of these can be considered as inputs the output being the price of the stock so in cases where you are able to feed in your algorithm a set of inputs and the output is 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 what is called supervised learning now why do we call it supervised because the output is known and it's the job of the algorithm to figure out which of these inputs matter and how do these inputs together uh go on to result in the output that we see right so that is supervised learning in unsupervised learning what typically happens is we have a set of inputs and we just throw it at the algorithm and ask it to uh figure out some patterns there so uh a typical example of that would be where you uh, you find that in facebook and many of these uh, social uh, media websites they start recognizing faces right even our our phones they start recognizing uh, our own face when we click photographs and stuff right and that's because that so you haven't created categories saying that those are my pictures those are the pictures of my dog or those are the pictures of my friend or whatever else right but the algorithm starts clustering together photographs by noticing certain patterns in those photographs so it it figures out that okay the person with this kind of a nose or this kind of a, a, a you know eyes or uh, the positions of their cheekbones or something it realizes that this belongs to the face of the same person and so on right so that that essentially talks about um, unsupervised learning where the algorithm is by itself learning to figure out how to cluster different groups or different uh things uh together right so in case of stocks if you throw in all the information related to some stocks uh of say uh a 100 publicly listed companies the unsupervised so a clustering algorithm would be able to separate out stocks which have similar characteristics right so what are those characteristics it depends on the inputs that you feed it so that's essentially uh, unsupervised learning and then you have deep learning and re reinforcement learning which try to mimic the way the human brain functions which is uh, where neural networks comes into play right so our brains have a set of neurons which uh, help us process the information that's fed to it uh, so that we are able to perceive it and absorb it and act upon it right so that's what deep learning and reinforcement learning does as you can see on the chart in front of you artificial intelligence is like a superset within that comes machine learning and deep learning is a sub sub part of machine learning which is even more specialized in terms of the methods that it employs all right so that is uh, you know a little bit of uh, gyan about uh, ai and ml now let's jump into the trading and investing landscape that we uh, live in right now uh, these days i think we all know that markets are increasingly dominated by algos the industry in general is moving towards utilizing of data and you want to keep automating various parts of your workflow of a, of 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 executing a trade of analysis before you uh, issue the order the the buy or the sell signal so there's 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 quite a bit of uh, you know excitement as well as action around automation and there is also use of these kind of tools such as uh, machine learning and ai to make 
trading decisions. So this is, I think, pretty uh, well known among uh, all of us who are part of you know the investment community. Now, why are we specifically using it in the context of financial markets? Well, to begin with, there's big data, right? Big data is this enormous quantity of data that gets generated. So it's humanly impossible for even uh, the, the most seasoned market participant to make complete sense of that data because it's not possible to absorb that much of information. So uh, you need machines and you need programs to help you exploit insights that can be gained from that kind of data. Uh, in order to do that, you have like a plethora of statistical and mathematical tools, right? And all of them these days are available at your fingertips. You have so many high level programming languages which are able to do most of the heavy lifting for you. So uh, at a con conceptual level, once you decide what you want to do, you have all of these uh, libraries and programs which can do a lot of these things for you, right? These days, you even have things like visual coding tools which are available for people that are not familiar or that are not uh, exposed to uh, standard programming practices, right? So, uh, so all of this is trying to bring uh, access to certain tools and techniques which used to have a pretty high entry barrier, right? And uh, what all of this does is it helps you scan hundreds of assets as well as hundreds of metrics so that the algo can then decide what it wants to use in order to predict market movements, right? Now, how, how is AI and ML used in financial markets? Well, uh, it's used in order to create test and validate testing strategies. So you use it in conception, uh, in ideation. You want to test it on historical data, what we call back testing. And after you do that, you'll do some paper trading where you're not employing real money, but uh, you will simulate the experience of uh, actual trades and see how it performs out of sample or uh, as we call it in, in the test data set, right? you want to use it to predict market movements. So when I say market movements, it can be both directional as well as uh, the magnitude of the direction. So uh, where is the Sensex headed? Where is the Nifty headed in, the, in terms of direction? Or it can be to what level or to what specific uh, price it's led. Uh, it's also used to extract features or characteristics from our data set which have predictive power, right? So uh, like I said, with a specific stock, there are so many different uh, characteristics associated with a stock or a, or a company that not all of them are going to be useful or uh, are going to help you generate some sort of uh, predictive accuracy from there. So these kind of algos help you call out the ones that are going to help you the most, right? They also help, uh, help you recommend the actions that an investor can take in, in trading sessions. So all of these together, they drive what she should do, what the investor should, should, uh, should do when markets open or in the next trading session. Do you want to go long? Do you want to stay invested? Do you want to short the asset? All of these things uh, come into play. Uh, these algos are used a lot in portfolio management. So you, you may want to rebalance your portfolio at uh, periodic intervals, maybe at the end of a week or at the end of a month or at the end of a quarter. So you can do the analysis of all the new data that's come in and uh, do the rebalancing on those specific days that you set out, right? So these are some things that uh, you can do. So now I want to touch upon a specific illustration of using regression, which is one, which is like a supervised learning technique, machine learning technique in order to predict prices. Now for this, uh, we have a course on uh, the Quantity website on Quantra called Trading with Machine Learning Regression. So this is like an intermediate level course. And uh, I'm going to show you a few snapshots from that course in order to demonstrate the point I'm making here, right? So, in all, so this is in terms of the flow of what we are trying to do. So what we're trying to do is we have a set of, we, we have the data that we need. So we, we take the data set, we import it into our program, we create a certain bunch of indicators. We create the X and Y data sets. So the capital X that you see is where all the features of your data set are uh, stored. Y is the output of your data set that you're looking for, right? 
and then you do some general checking of your data. You split your data into train and test. This is again standard uh, boilerplate stuff in a typical machine learning kind of workflow. Uh, once you have your training data set, you use something in this case, you will use like a, a multivariate regression model to predict something related to that uh, specific data set that you're looking at. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the specifics of what we're trying to predict in my next slide, but nevertheless, you use it to do some prediction. From that prediction, you're trying to, you're going to try to generate certain signals. And once you have those signals, you generate uh, your buys or sells when markets open the next, in the next trading session, right? Once you do all this and you imagine that you did this, you obviously want to know what happened. Did that result in you profiting or did you lose money? Did you gain money? That's what you eventually want to check, right? So this is like, I would say like a workflow in terms of how you, you go about your business. So in this specific course, what we did was we were working with uh, the gold EDF prices. The objective being you want to come up with a trading strategy using ETF prices of gold using uh, OHLCB data. So OHLCB, as uh, uh, you, you guys, some of you might know, is the open, high, low, close volume. So this is the daily data that gets generated. So we are going to work with daily data, right? And uh, our option, and what we're going to do is, as I said, we're going to use multivariate regression. So uh, what you see on your screens is the standard model for a multivariate regression, which is Y is equal to Sigma beta I X I plus epsilon, where epsilon is the error and uh, xi is the ith independent parameter. The betas associated with it are the regression coefficients and y is of course the dependent variable, right? Now, what we are making our dependent variable is the next day's high and low prices. And uh, or rather, th that's what we want to predict. What we do in this specific cases, we are going to try and predict the upper and lower deviations from open. <clears throat> All right. So in order to do that, we create a bunch of different variables. So we create some moving averages. So what you see here on your screen is a snapshot of these various X size that we created. So we created, so we want to use open. We want to use some moving averages like S3, S15, S60. So uh, we are looking at difference between open and close between open and previous days open and so on. Right. So we, Essentially, the, 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 the long and short of it is we take a bunch of variables, which uh, we take as uh, our X size, and we use that to predict the deviations from open, which we then use to predict the next day's high and low prices, right? So once you have that, what you do is, if the actual high is greater than predicted high, or the actual low is greater, uh, greater than predicted low, you sell the GLD ETF and you buy it if the reverse happens, right? So this is uh, the, the kind of trading strategy we come up with based on the predictions we made in the previous uh, place. And uh, the screenshot that you see here gives you an idea of how this strategy performed with respect to just uh, holding the GLD, like doing a buy and hold on the GLD. Right. So this was run for about two and a half years from 2017 to over 2019. And as you can see this in general, the strategies did pretty well in, in the, in the period that uh, we've shown you. So this is like a very brief illustration of how you can use something like regression to predict prices. Now, obviously there are uh, you know dozens of different applications using various algorithms and uh, due to the paucity of time, I'm only giving you guys like a, like a trailer version of what you can do using regression. Uh, now, as I mentioned, academic research also throws a lot of light on what can potentially be done using these various AI ML models in the markets. So for instance, uh, I've mentioned about a paper that I came across where neural networks are used to look at fundamental and technical data to predict characteristics of high performing stocks. So that way you just are able to pull out all the high performing stocks and then decide whether you want to uh, trade specifically only on those stocks. You can use uh, recurrent uh, neural networks, RNNs with linear output predictions 
to trade currencies at different levels of investment risk. So this particular strategy that uh, uh, these researchers came up with can be used for investors or uh, clients at different levels, at different investment profiles, risk profiles, I mean, right? Then uh, you have things like natural language processing, which allows you to classify news, right? News sentiment that comes from various places, whether it's uh, the standard mainstream press or whether it's social media, uh, you can classify news as positive, negative, or neutral. Uh, so maybe you use it. So the, the, the study that I came across was tracking what's happening on the Spanish stock exchange, the IBEX 35. And uh, if you were to formulate uh, signals, that is the positive, negative, neutral, based on the news sentiment about the IBEX 35 and use that to trade based on the positive, uh, negative, neutral signals, it beats uh, a buy and hold sort of returns that you get on the markets. You have various firms again, like Extract Alpha, that what they do is they use natural language processing to track the kind of uh, conversations that happen on blogs and various online forums like Reddit. Uh, you know, we, we came across that Reddit uh, incident that happened about a year or year back, right? Uh, with this organization GameStop, whose price was driven up and stuff. So there are companies that track the chatter on blogs to come up with buy and sell recommendations. And hedge funds are, uh, uh, they, they often buy this kind of alternative data analysis from such firms, right? Because people are looking for that elusive alpha from various places, alternative data coming from, you know, literally anywhere that data gets generated. And uh, this kind of sentiment analysis that comes from NLP can also be used to analyze not just uh, things to do with uh, the, the financial markets. It can also be used to analyze things like liquidity and how prices are moving in the real estate market. So there's, there have been studies that have done that also. They've used uh, these kind of techniques to see uh, how real estate prices and volumes are moving in, in, in the US, right? So this is some of the stuff that, uh, I came across in in uh, in the academic research while you know while I was uh, reading up on these topics. All right, uh, the last couple of things I want to talk about before we open up for questions is some. So I've spoken about all the different things we can do. We saw an illustration of regression also, but let's now talk about some of the challenges when we want to deploy an AI system in in the financial markets. Now. Um, one of the biggest challenges that organizations as well as individuals face is the lack of interpretability of uh, these models, right? It's hard to explain, hard to interpret because they, they have a very black box kind of approach. It spits out a result and uh, you just need to sort of uh, run with it, right? If you've adequately tested and validated your models, you just run with it. Uh, it's hard to come up with some sort of economic or, uh, you know, financial theory kind of justification as to why we buy or sell. And that becomes a little tricky when uh, these models or the decisions that are being sp uh, uh, spitted out by these models need to be approved by stakeholders, right? Stakeholders in a, in a large organization, which brings me to my second point, which is the stakeholders lack of understanding, right? So a lot of times the people involved, the decision makers involved may not themselves be uh, trained in these specific areas, right? So that also becomes a bit of a challenge when it comes to deploying as well as, uh, you know, even implementing these models uh, in, in uh, financial institutions. A third very, very important and uh, a very real problem is the shortage of uh, the workforce, right? There are just not enough uh, people around who understand both the, 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 the technical uh, aspects of artificial intelligence, that is the, the computer science parts where you need a reasonable grip on the topic to fix and debug problems that you encounter. And uh, you are sufficiently competent with respect to understanding the financial markets. So that kind of uh, skill, which combines both uh, technical chops as well as uh, financial market expertise is, is hard to come by. So there is a shortage of, uh, you know, the, 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 the skill uh, labor for, for these kind of roles. Then there's, of course, data availability and quality. Uh, a lot of time is spent on cleaning of data and 
verifying and uh, sanitizing the kind of data sets that are used. Sometimes these data sets are behind paywalls. Sometimes they're not adequately scrutinized. So these are issues that, that uh, come up when we're dealing with uh, deploying these kind of systems. There is these days, of course, the increased regulatory scrutiny that's coming up because uh, there's a lot of um, apprehension because it's so new whether it's algorithmic trading or whether it's employ, uh, employing any kind of automation in uh, executing trades. Uh, various regulators, whether it is uh, in the Indian context, whether it's uh, SEBI or whether it's uh, the exchanges like an NSE or a BSE, or whether it's, uh, you know, even I'd say uh, sometimes tax authorities, Various authorities would like to uh, keep an eye on uh, finance ministries and stuff would want to are, are a little cagey about uh, the benefit or the costs of enabling uh, these kind of uh, technologies in the financial markets. And uh, also these models take a while to implement. So the reason for implementation is also connected to the previous points, which is you know, availability of data, as well as not having enough people who can work on your model and uh, review it and scrutinize it and stuff, right? So these are some of the challenges that uh, we face when we have to deploy AI systems. And what are the risks that these kind of AI-enabled systems pose to the financial markets? Well, for one, if uh, similar such models are deployed by traders, it... Uh, it can increase herding behavior and sharp price moves, right? So you could have cases where you, you have these one direction markets and uh, market makers may not even be around in cases like these. So that required liquidity in, in the other direction is not just being provided. If, if too many such models are being deployed by traders, uh, the reliance on third party data sources can lead to market manipulation potentially, right? There are uh, data privacy concerns also that come into play because uh, the more you look around for alternative data, a lot of these devices can also seem like surveillance devices, right? In terms of what they're tracking and uh, the extent to which and the amount of data that they accumulate on each of us, right? So this also uh, comes into play. And uh, this kind of deployment of AI and ML kind of models could increase the uh, connectedness between different financial markets, which are considered to be independent of each other. It could also uh, increase the connectedness of institutions that uh, may be considered independent of each other in, in, in ways that perhaps we cannot even uh, imagine or conceive today, right? So these are, uh, I would say, some of the risks that, that exist. So uh, considering all the, 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 the various things that we spoke about today, I think all things considered, some the, the, there are no two ways about the fact that uh, these technologies, that is artificial intelligence and machine learning, are sh reshaping the way market participants trade and behave these days, both at retail level as well as at institutional level. Uh, there's no doubt about the fact that uh, these kind of automated systems can find and take advantage of the patterns in data that are not uh, possible to the human eye, right? And uh, those institutions that are now building capacity to execute trades or automate trades by scanning, you know, hundreds of these opportunities uh, contemporaneously are becoming, you know, differentiators in terms of how uh, they perform, right? Not just that, they are also becoming sort of talent magnets for uh, the best and the brightest to join those firms. And then eventually, you know, that can, that, that, that becomes like a competitive advantage for such kind of large institutions. So uh, I think that kind of pretty much covers all the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, this is, like I said, this is not even the tip of the iceberg. This is the tip of the tip of the iceberg. So I would strongly encourage you guys to continue your learning if you're interested in these topics. We have a number of books uh, by Quantity, including a book, by the way, on implementing machine learning models. So it's written by two of my dear colleagues, uh, Ishan and Rekit, uh, which directly talks about implementation. 
uh, model after model after model specifically for financial markets. So if you're interested, you should probably take a look at that. Uh, there are these interactive courses on Quantra, which uh, from whose, whose uh, screen grabs I showed you a little while back. There is Blue Shift, the research trading and, uh, you know, uh, back testing platform that is available. And then there are there is our blogs where there's like uh, blogs on various topics under the sun with respect to financial markets. All right. So thank you, folks. Uh, that kind of covers all the things I wanted to talk about. So it's now open for Q&A. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would request all the participants, if they have any questions, they can write to us in the chat box and then we can take them out. Uh, Vishal, just let me know if you see any questions, all right? I'm not quite sure I can see oh, any. Yes, yes, yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay, I think I see a question from Mithul. So Mithul asks, uh, can this apply to things other than financial markets like commodity prices or data analysis and predictive future prices? Absolutely, Mithul. So the kind of techniques that we're... I hope I'm not on mute. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it's absolutely applicable. When it comes to using machine learning models or artificial intelligence, a lot has to do with uh, two things. One is the algorithm that you're using and how suitable it is for the specific business problem that you're trying to solve. And the second, which is even more important, is the data that you're able to feed into your model. So if you don't have enough data, these models don't do that well. Uh, the more experience that you can throw at it, in other words, the more historical data that you have, the better these models perform. So it's absolutely applicable to uh, all of the things that you just mentioned here. So, you know, Vishaga, uh, I, I regularly take lectures in our various programs. And uh, when we don't get, when I don't get any questions, right, it means either of two things. One is uh, everybody's so clear about everything that was spoken that uh, no doubts have come into people's minds. Or the second, which is more likely, is that uh, people have probably, you know, dozed off and they need, a, they need to be woken up. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, for sure. I'm. Uh, I might get uh, questions uh, later in my email. Sure, so sure. once I get, I 
I will, you know, get in touch with you uh, for the, you know, answers. Sure. So for now, I would uh, like to conclude this session. Uh, sir, it was a very comprehensive and exhaustive discussion covering all the aspects of the subject. And I'm sure that all the participants would be taking along with them uh, immense amount of knowledge and experience obtained from your discussion. For any other uh, queries, uh, I would request participants. They, our coordinates are there on the screen. Uh, you can contact us anytime. Thank you so much.